Amen. Hey, would you guys stand with me as we read this opening verse? It's going to be one of the most encouraging verses you have read all week. You ready for this? Turn your Bibles to Proverbs 14, verse 12. This will, unless we just put this up on the screen, I don't think, well, this wasn't in my, my notes, but you've got your Bibles, you've got your phones, you guys can turn there. Proverbs 14, verse 12. And here we go. You guys ready for this? Let's read this. It says this, there is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. How's that for some encouragement? Okay. Let's pray real fast. Lord, we thank you for what this word says. And I pray, Lord, that you would help me to unpack and convey everything that you've been speaking to me about this message here today for our church. And for those who are here in this room, for those who are watching online, Lord, help us take the seed that we received from you today and let it bear fruit in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. You guys can be seated. There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. I chose to start with this passage, and it kind of came to me a little late because the Lord was just really speaking to me and unpacking the message for today, centered around this topic that we've been on as a church for the last several weeks on prophecy. And I was curious to see what the Lord was going to give to me for my piece in, in, this, uh, in this topic. And the piece that he has given me for today is one that is coming at it from maybe the back end or the back door. And we've, got some, we've had some great messages brought on this topic. I encourage you, go back onto our, our YouTube channel. You guys can check all the sermons out there. Uh, some awesome messages and even last week's message on, on prophetic worship and praise. And, and, and man, it's just everything has been clicking together so well. And so I was curious to see what the Lord was going to give because, to be honest, I mean, it's been so good that it's like, okay, well, I, what can I add to this? And this is why I love God, because he's got one voice. And he may give you something and you something and then give me something. And then in the revelation of all of it, there's cohesiveness to it all. And then we go, man, how, I didn't think that this could get any better. Uh, and then there's more to it that gets added, and you go, whoa, I had not thought about that. I had not seen that before. And so I hope that today is, is much of that in my approach for uh, describing and communicating what he's put on my heart here today. And he led me to this passage because he wants me to talk to you about skepticism of prophecy. And this is not going to be a message. I, I, I don't know how this message is going to really come out. Uh, I, I, know, I know what he wants me to say, but I don't, I, I hope that you will hear me in everything that I present to you today. My goal for today is to hopefully reach you if you are at a place or if you're watching online and you're at a place where you have ever doubted prophecy, if it's still relevant, if it's still alive and active, I don't know what your upbringing has been in the church. I don't know what your experience has been. But whatever you, wherever you have come from or wherever you're at right now, I hope that you'll hear the words that we talk about today. And my prayer is that you will allow the Lord to do a work here so that he can reveal to you everything that's on his heart regarding this topic. Because we know as a prophetic church, this is not something that, that, that God is done with, that he still is very active in this. And so we never know, you know, on each week, I mean, we could have someone uh, who joins us who we don't know what, where they, uh, what they've grown up in as far as teaching goes, or, or maybe their experiences, their life experiences, their church experiences has painted a bad picture of prophecy. And so then it makes them immediately gun shy. Coming from somebody who has grown up in uh, in an in, in atmosphere of 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 practicing and, and believing that the gifts of the Spirit were not dispensed just for one time and then done, but that they are definitely still active here today in, in today's world, 
My hope is that you will allow me to speak to you very plainly and directly. And if you are someone who has that skepticism or a wall built up, that you'll hear me. And hopefully, beyond me, allow God to, to reveal to you something new today. You guys with me on that? You guys okay with that? I wanted to start with this verse because this verse in Proverbs shows us that it's possible to believe something and to think that it's right and it still be wrong. Now, you could sit there and you could say the same from another perspective to maybe the position I'm about to propose. But at the end of it, we have to look at the fruit. We've got to look at the things that point to what makes, is there, is this thing living? Is this thing true? Is there cohesiveness with the spirit? Is there cohesiveness with what God has written in his word? Uh, and as we begin to do that, yes, this passage definitely points to, uh, we, could, we could see maybe like a, a, a mega theme of the world versus people who believe that Jesus is the son of God believers and unbelievers, that there is a way that the world preaches that you could live this way, do this, and this is right, and this is good, but it does not end an eternal life. So there is that mega theme, but then I want to submit to you that, that if the mega theme is true, then it's possible for there to be minor themes that make this true within the church, meaning it's possible for us, and I think you'll understand this way better, it's possible for you and I to have bad theology or to believe something about God and it actually, in fact, be true about him when we think that it's not. It's possible. You, you, can, go, you can go and you can read in scripture all throughout, time, all throughout the Old Testament and even in the New Testament. Paul is a great example where he is operating under a mindset, a teaching, a theology that is God, is, God is this, God is zealous, God wants me to, uh, to stomp out the church, this, this, these, these, these revolutionists who are preaching this new Messiah, and, and they're coming against tradition, and they're, and they're heretics, and then what happens? There's revelation, he meets and encounters Jesus, and his life is radically changed, but most importantly, the bad theology was flushed down the toilet right there in that moment, okay? So, so, there is a way that seems right to a man. Paul could read this and, and completely, he, he could empathize with this verse. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. The reason why I'm starting with all of this is because prophecy exposes by nature. Prophecy in its, in its characteristics, it's like you, it's likened to what I would think like a flashlight. It's almost like you go, it, it would be as if we turned off all of the lights right here in the sanctuary, right here in, in this room, or maybe it's at nighttime and you're at your house and you're fumbling through the darkness and you're trying to see something, or maybe you have something that's very intricate or that's very beautiful, or you've been in a room, an old house, whatever it is that didn't have electricity, and then when someone turns the electricity on or you're granted some access to a flashlight or what have you, candle, fire, whatever, and it brings light to a situation, it allows you and affords you the ability to see things clearly, right? right? And how many of us have ever been in a situation where we've thought we knew something about a document, a room, whatever it is, and because of the lack of light, when new light is exposed in that, or a brighter light is exposed in that, we begin to see things that we never saw before. We go, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that that was actually like a shade of purple on the wall. It actually looked blue to me. I don't know. Or, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that on this old, old uh, picture that I had, you know, you, you're shining a light over it, and I, didn't, I never realized that there were these details down here. Prophecy in its nature is like God's flashlight. It illuminates for the sake of building one another up. And what happens, though, in that is our hearts are so deceitful and our hearts are so polluted with so many things that we will have a tendency in the flesh to want to despise prophecy naturally. It is in our nature as human beings to want to naturally despise prophecy. 
because we don't want to be exposed. We don't want the illumination to come. We don't want... And, and if you disagree with me in this at all, I'm just even thinking of right now about uh, John's gospel, about how he says that the light came into the world and that the, that the men did not want uh, their, their darkness deeds exposed because they, and they, they wanted the darkness rather than the light. But he came and he lived among us and he ministered among us and he shone a great light and brought revelation. But the men of this world, want nothing, they wanted nothing to do with it because they felt exposed. And so prophecy is, 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 it, it is in its nature this very thing. And as a prophetic church, we are going to be in the business not of exposing people, but exposing, bringing light into dark places. And when we do that, it's not to puff any one person up. It's hopefully to build all of us up. It's ne- it should never, ever operate as a means to puff me up if I'm the one giving a prophetic word, it is always meant to build the entire church up to bring glory to God. That should be the, that should be the ultimate right. purpose for it, okay? Now, with our hearts, though, because they're so polluted, how many of y'all know this? You could be in the middle of a church service, someone starts doing something, someone starts saying something. It might start to go a little bit beyond or go to a different route than maybe what your normal church experience has been. And you start to go, Hmm, what's that? And it's gotten a lot worse since like the internet, like thanks Al Gore, but like literally to be able to have access to the world's knowledge of people's narratives and, and, and uh, people's, people's opinions on experiences in church settings or in conference settings or wherever it is. And then they, they'll paint these negative narratives about someone being prayed over or someone being ministered to. I'm not here to vouch for some of the crazy things that you see online, okay? I'm not here to do that. We'd be here all night. (laughs) But what I am here to hopefully communicate to you is this. Your heart cannot be the only indicator or the ultimate indicator of, of what is right and wrong. If you make it the ultimate, the supreme, the standard, I'm gonna tell you right now, the best men and women in this world who still love Jesus, they love God, they serve God with all their heart, even they still have polluted heart and are in desperate need of a savior. No one is better than anyone. And because our heart is so deceitful, how can we fully trust it? Now, I'm taking all of this, I'm speaking from all this, and this is found in scripture. Turn with me to Jeremiah 17, verses 9 and 10. Jeremiah 17, verses 9 and 10 says this. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. If you actually translate that phrase, desperately sick, uh, one of the ways that it could be translated back to is uh, incurable or polluted. And how telling is that? It's so true. The heart is desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. Even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. Y'all, the the thing with, when you, if you have been, if you spent any time in this church, we, we, we are not just trying to be a different church because we wanna be different. We are convicted about what we read in here. We're convicted by it. And when we read 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 and 14 and read throughout the epistles about how God has not only given spiritual gifts, but he's given you and I abilities to operate and minister to the world and to each other in capacities that go well beyond our physical abilities. And we also don't read in any part of the New Testament or any part of the Old Testament that there's an expiration date on any of those gifts. And we also have greater evidence to believe based off New Testament scripture that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Then I I can't, again, we would be here all night. I would talk till I'm blue in the face trying to convince you that what we operate, how we operate here as a church and what we teach from this pulpit in in the the practicality and in uh, in the order operation of order of spiritual gifts 
that we speak from in this church, it comes from conviction. It's not because we want to try to be different. It's not because we're in the Bible Belt and there's thousands of churches here and we just got to find our, we got to find our niche. It's not, it's not, it has nothing to do with that. We are trying to just simply preach what we hear, what we read, and, and what the Lord has revealed. And if you have ever been in this church and you've come from a traditional background and you've ever encountered something here and you go, hmm, what was that? This is the condition that we're highlighting here today. Because in those moments, the enemy loves to try to sow doubt, skepticism, and ultimately, if he wins over, bitterness. Not only towards the spirit, but towards the person who's operating in the spirit. It, it, and, and, and it's a slippery slope. And again, we use the government, most of the time, what I have found, I know I'm a young man. I know I've, I've got a lot more to learn. But what I've found in my time in ministry is that what we feel most uncomfortable by cont- uh, 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 pertaining to the things of the spirit, the things that we feel most uncomfortable by oftentimes are a good indicator of something that God wants to do in our life. And because we are naturally, by, as just human beings, we are creatures of comfort, we don't want to be uncomfortable we will point the finger at someone else and say, you're the problem when we fail to realize that we have three fingers pointing back at us. And we forget, lest we forget, that our heart is deceitful and polluted and incurable. And it's hard. It's, I, I'm not trying to, I'm just trying to paint this picture. I'm just, try, I'm just trying to reason with you. Don't, you cannot let this be the ultimate supreme indicator of what is right and wrong. If we do this, we're no better than the world. This is what the world preaches. Jesus came not to renovate this, but to exchange this. This is not a renovation show. This is not him coming in and being like, you're gonna look the same and you're gonna talk the same and you're gonna act the same. No, this is my life I'm giving to you, son and daughter my life, the only life that lived it perfectly to God's standard. You don't get to replicate, you get to participate. I will participate in you. And he does this because the heart is deceitful and it can't be cured. It's not going to ever be cured. It needs redemption. It needs a savior. You with me? So the enemy will paint this, he'll, he'll, th- this is the scenario that no- normally will happen. And we've seen this a lot in our church in the life of our ministry. We operate under the conviction, again, that the gifts of the spirit are alive and that they are operational, that they are not for exalting a man or a woman, but they are for exalting the church to glorify God. That if everything is, is done in order, God is not a God of confusion. He is a God of order. And that there, is very, there are very specific gifts that he gives. And that's the beauty of it is that you don't get to choose them, is that he gives them to you. That's the beauty of it. Come see me after if you have problem with that. There's beauty in that. There's total beauty in it. And what's awesome about it is that as we are faithful to operate in them, it starts to not only strengthen and edify the spirit that is within you, but it also starts to expose just how big our flesh is. Because how many of us know that if we've ever been in a situation where the Lord has been speaking to us or prompting us to go and speak or pray over someone, the first thing that you feel is fear. The first thing that you feel is apprehension. The first thing when God asks you to do or move in some big way and some operate in some big faith step, which is a gift of the spirit, the gift of faith to be able to go into a, 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 a room or to... I don't know, give something that you've, that you've never thought of giving or move in such a capacity that, that is such a big faith step for you. The first thing that you feel is, I don't, I don't know if I could do that. Do you think that that's God's voice talking or do you think that's yours? It, w- it would be yours. 
Well, we know that God's not going to be like, hey, I want you to go and I want you to, I want you to go and minister to that person because he really needs to be ministered to. And then also in the same breath, turn around and be like, well, I actually don't think that you should go do that. <laughs> He's not going to do that. And I'm glad we can laugh at that, okay? But, but it's a sick condition, y'all. It's sick. And when you move in the spirit, you begin to see just how operational you are in the flesh. It really is. This is, no, this is nothing new. Jesus spoke about this. Jesus, Jesus made it a very abundantly clear that the flesh and the spirit are in opposition to one another. So what, what I've seen, though, in, in ministry is that in, in our church, as we operate in the spirit, there are situations that arise that give people the opportunity to either move into a new place of living in cohabitation with the spirit, or it gives them an opportunity to move in the flesh. And where there is always one, there will always be the other present. There's always going to be both opportunities in a present moment. I can either be moved into the spirit and, and trust and go, you know what, Lord, if I'm feeling, if I'm feeling hypercritical, if I'm feeling uh, judgmental, if I'm feeling bitter, if I'm, if I'm feeling anger, if I'm feeling any of these things, then what, that, that, none of those things are from you. What is it that is from you? Well, love and joy and peace and, 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 and wanting to be, uh, wanting to esteem others more than myself and laying down my life for my brothers and my sisters and being self-controlled and, and being kind and gentle and not only all the fruits of the spirit, but just even the characteristics that we see exemplified in Jesus and his time in the earth. And then, and also the instructions that we receive from the apostles and the epistles of, 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 of how we're supposed to conduct ourselves as Christians. When I examine the things in the nature of the flesh of wanting to get anger, angered and, and, and embittered and get impatient and want to scorn or criticize, then on the opposite end has to be another set of characteristics that are exact opposite of what these things are. And when, the, when unfortunately, there are people who will, and, I, and I'm guilty of this too. This is not just immune to people who... Uh, this is not just immune to unbelievers. We have all operated in some type of capacitor where we have moved so highly into criti critical thinking that we, we almost, uh, we diminish the ability for God to move in our life because we're so critical of what's happening. And, and again, th this comes back to the position of our heart. Where are we in our heart? And the heart is not only deceitful and, it de and it's desperately sick as Jeremiah writes, but also there's a work that God wants to do in our heart so that faith can arise, amen? So when we're in those situations, if we've ever experienced them, I think some of the things that we, we really feel are, we feel uh, this challenge almost. It's like a battle. Because we have such a tendency in this, in our culture, to want to come into church, we dress up nice, we come in, we can sit down, we can stand up, we sing some songs, we see our friends, and it's nice, and it's pleasurable, and it's exciting, and it's, and it's fulfilling. But it's so easy for us to slip into a mode where we are so accustomed to routine that we don't want to be challenged. We don't want accountability. And the second we have leaders or other brothers or sisters who step in to give accountability, who step in to challenge, step in to lead, to step in to encourage and lift, it's met with, hold on, what, what? No, I don't want that. Have it, has anyone else experienced that? It's, it's this, it's a, I don't know where it is or how it has become allowed so prevalent in the church, but we all think that we just know better than everyone else. We just do. We all just, we just, the, 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 thing that, the thing that is like most true is that everyone is just too selfish to just think about me. <laughs> you know? And if, and if everyone could just be less selfish and just think about me, then we would be fine. <laughs> and if we could all just be so less selfish to just take my way, then we'd be totally good. 
That's, that is the tendency that I see so prevalent whenever we start talking about things of the Spirit. People start to have this uh, invisible eye roll come over and they start to scorn. And I'm speaking soberly this morning because there's things that God wants to do in our community that we cannot do in our flesh. We need the gifts of the Spirit to be able to do them. You have to have these gifts in your life to go where you're going in the future. You have no idea where you're going. Look at me. You got no clue what you're gonna do in life. Your life could look totally different in five years, in two years, in a month. You have no idea, but you know who does know? God. He knows exactly where you're going. On the podcast a few weeks ago, we were talking about your, uh, your testimony and about how you had such a disdain for speaking in tongues. And uh, by the way, uh, shameless plug for the Eastgate podcast, Tuesdays and Thursdays, go check it out. Uh, But I love one of the things that got brought up though, is that one of the things we started really digging in on was you, God knew that the 30 year old Chris in that season needed the gift of speaking in tongues for the 60 year old Chris, you needed it. And, and because of the things that you're tackling right now, like you, if you had no, if you did not have that gift, that tool, man, you know? And so that's all I'm submitting to you is that in the flesh, we're gonna use Pastor Chris as an example here. In the flesh, Pastor Chris, who was not a pastor at the time, wanted nothing to do with this spiritual gift. He's, uh, he said, he, a matter of fact, his words were, Lord, you can give me any spiritual gift except that one. <laughs> that was his gift. That was his, th- those were his words. And yet God had, a, God had his, his, his plan for, for Pastor Chris. And so I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna just, I wanna beg you as a brother, I know you think that you know it all right now but don't be so hasty to say something lest you invite an amplified, concentrated effort from the Lord to invade your life in a way that exposes something in you, maybe when you're not even ready for it. Because what ended up happening was, was it like a few months after or like within that year that you had like probably said or were believing those things? He ended up having that encounter that we've all, you know, we, we won't get into fully today, but it was life-changing for him. And he ended up getting the gift that he said he didn't want. And how's that work? How many of y'all have had a birthday party before? And your parents got you something that you didn't want. And you're like, what in the world? I do not want this. I did not ask for this. But then you come to find out that you actually really love it. You actually really enjoy it. And that not only that, but you actually needed it. It's the same with the gifts of the Spirit. And I'm, 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 I'm speaking specifically right now to not unbelievers, because we can imagine how they would feel about this. I'm speaking to believers who have a skeptical doubt of spiritual gifts. I'm speaking to you right now. And I want to, I want to admonish you here right now and just ask you, keep coming with me, because I want to show you something here in Scripture. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 24, we'll start there. We'll have it up here on the screen for you. It reads this, verses 24 and 25 of chapter 14. But if all prophesy, Paul writes, and an unbeliever or an ungifted man enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed. And so he will fall on his face and worship God, declaring that God is certainly among you. This is is a part of the chapter where Paul has gotten finished explaining what the spiritual gifts are, but but then specifically giving instruction on how you use these spiritual gifts in a church service. And so he says this, this, these two verses, if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an ungifted man enters and he's convicted by all, he is called to account by all, the secrets of his hearts are, are disclosed, so he will fall on his face and worship God, declaring that God is certainly among you. Now, when we read that verse, I have read that verse so many times growing up, but when we read that verse, 
Most of the time we read that and we go, man, see, this is proof that God can use prophecy to minister to unbelievers. And he can use this, he can use this gift to shine on their life in such a way that he gives them, whether it's like a, a Paul experience or, or any experience that is just, uh, that we can read about in, in scripture that was revealing to a person. And they said, Lord, and they repented or and they had a change of life or whatever. And God can do that for unbelievers. But one thing he showed me here today was that in this passage, we read over another very important person that's described in this verse. He's not only talking to unbelievers, but he's also talking to ungifted men. And so what he speaks of here, if all, he says, but if all prophesy in an unbeliever or an ungifted man enters, separating it from an unbeliever, this could be, this could be translated essentially as someone who believes in Jesus, but who does not operate or believe in spiritual gifts. An ungifted man enters, and he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed, so he will fall on his face and worship God, declaring, God is certainly among you. We have seen that time and time again in this church not only from unbelievers, but from people who have walked with the Lord for a very long time, who love Jesus. And they come in here and they go, you know, I've had such a disdain for hypercharismania. And I just felt the Lord so strongly here. And he did something in my life today. I wanna know more. Again, I'm speaking to the skeptic here. This verse is for you. For the ungifted man or woman who enters, what happens in that moment when the church is prophesying? The secret of their heart is exposed. Well, we just got done talking about how the heart is so deceitful. Well, we have just uncovered the enemy's number one tactic in trying to keep you and I from engaging in the the prophetic. This is what happens when you prophesy or when someone prophesies to you, the secrets of your heart are disclosed. Now this could be very good or very bad because to the degree that there's a secret that you are operating in and living in or believing, you may not want it exposed. And so there might be things that come up in your life by being a part of this church or being a part of someone who is moving in a prophetic way, that they bring some type of exposure to something that God is trying to illuminate in your life. And when it gets illuminated and uncovered, not in a shameful way, because there's definitely etiquette for it. And I believe next week is, uh, or in the f- com- some of the coming weeks, we're gonna be giving prophetic etiquette, um, a sermon on prophetic etiquette, I believe. But when it gets exposed, there's a tendency to go, "Ah, I don't want that out there. And it's a revelation of truly the maturity level of who we're dealing with in a believer. I say that soberly because what happens is God is trying to do something, but if if we are too uncomfortable by the work, we have total power to remove ourselves from that work and go, ah, no. Not yet. Nope, ain't doing that. Or better, or worse yet, be like, you know, I just don't think that pro- that prophecy exists anymore. So I'm just gonna, I, I'm, I'm not gonna come to this church anymore. I wanna go over here um, because I don't like the feeling of being told that I'm wrong all the time. I don't like the feeling of feeling exposed. I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to be funny right now. I'm being these are things that these are things that people think. These are these are just very real things that people think. And so, prophecy again, though, is by nature, it's it is like a flashlight. It's there to illuminate things in our hearts so that God can do a work in us. You guys, you guys, still with me? It says in the very first part of chapter fourteen, First Corinthians, it says. When someone prophesies, they speak for edification, exhortation, and consolation. So prophecy in its nature is meant to build you up. It's not meant to tear you down. 
It's not meant to bring shame onto you. It's not meant to make you feel dirty. It's not meant to make you feel lesser than. It's not meant to make you feel stupid. It's not meant to make you feel like you are beneath the person who is giving you the word. It's never meant for that. That is never its intention. That's never its characteristic. It should never flow from that. There's beauty that can come from someone speaking the truth in love. Don't get me wrong. But sometimes, man, how many of us have ever had a good friend say something or a family member say something to us that we really needed to hear, that we didn't really want to hear, but when we heard it, we were like, wow, yeah, needed that, but didn't want that. Can I get an amen on that? And when you prophesy, it's meant to build someone up in that. But you know what happens? You know what the opposite of that is? To destroy someone, to discourage someone, and to confuse someone. Which sounds an awful lot like the characteristics that we read about in John 10.10 of the thief. Jesus says that the thief only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. When, the, when people oppose the prophetic, it puts a damper on what God wants to ultimately do in that space. It happens. The title of my message, can't believe I'm just now getting to it. Uh, it's no indicator of where we are in the, me- in the message, by the way, <laughs> uh, is extinguish. And I found it, it came to me from this passage here in 1 Thessalonians 5. Would you turn with me to uh, ch- verses 19 and 21 we're going to read of 1 Thessalonians 5. Paul writes this, Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully and hold fast to that which is good. Everyone say, do not quench. Do not quench the Spirit, Paul writes, and do not despise prophetic utterances. How many of us have ever been in a church service, and we can be honest here, and you've ever thought, boy, I ain't got that kind of faith. (laughs) Whoo, what are they doing over there, Lord? And maybe some of y'all have been in a church service here and thought, what is happening right now, okay? Um, We are very adamant about wanting to bring teaching around this because here's the thing, you don't just walk the first time when you get to the age of walking. You don't walk perfectly. You fall on your butt. You hit your face. You know, you you bust a tooth out. My, my, My middle son has done that, okay? And when that happens, you don't sit there and you go, what's your deal? You are no longer good enough to be my son. You'd never do that. There's grace, there's patience. And yet in any one of our lives, there are things that you're walking in and growing in as a believer, as a son and a daughter. And there is grace and patience here in this house for you to walk and run in those gifts. You're gonna stumble in them. You're not gonna be perfect in them, but there is grace for it. And I believe that that is why Paul put this phrase at the end of this passage here. Examine everything carefully and hold fast to that which is good because he knew he's the same author of the one in 1 Corinthians 13 who said that we see through a mirror dimly and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, it'll all be done away with because we won't need to have to prophesy anymore because he'll be here. So when we're here in this space and we're practicing on each other, There's grace for it. And I hope that that diminishes your fear from wanting to step out and to try it. Again, to the skeptic who would say, yeah, but I just don't know about that. I wasn't raised in that. I I, I just, I've never heard that teaching. And I've also seen a lot of bad fruit from people who have used it as a way, as a means of being like spiritually elite, or it's a, it's like a, it's like a spiritual badge of honor for these people. And, and there's just a lot of things that have happened or that I've seen and witnessed happen that just leaves me scratching my head. I would submit to you that it's okay for you to feel the confusion in that because there's specific instruction that God gives and how we're supposed to operate in these gifts. But let me tell you, even in the specific instruction that God gives to operate in these gifts, it's still going to bring a revelation in the spirit, which is in opposition to your flesh. And the flesh will not, have want, will not want to have any part in what is being revealed. 
No matter how good the teaching is, no matter how good the revelation is, no matter how strong the spirit is moving, the flesh will always oppose what the spirit wants to do. Always. You think that literally, like the apostles, they sensed that Jesus was going through something intense at that night at the Garden of Gethsemane. They knew something was different. Judas had just done something weird and he left and then he's like, hey, come pray with me. And all of a sudden they look over and he's sweating blood and they're like, what is happening right now? You think that they could not sense that something was going on that just was different and yet what happened? They still fell asleep. And so you cannot indicate, don't let your flesh indicate how much God wants to move. Don't let it be the barometer that tells you, oh yeah, okay, well I feel good enough for God to move today. Man, that's scary. Paul would have rejected everything if God had revealed to him his plan initially. But it took a moment of surprise for it to catch Paul off guard, for him to be moved and to, be, to have that change in life course on his road to Damascus. You with me? The enemy hates prophecy and he will attempt to place contempt in your heart for it. And if left unchecked, the scheme of the enemy tries to get you to hate it so much so that the secrets of your heart will remain, which leads to bitterness, which leads to death. That's why he doesn't like prophecy because he does not want the light of heaven to be illuminated in the circumstance, in the situation, or in your heart. So then what he'll do is he'll, he'll package it in such a way to where it'll, it'll seem harmless at first and in, and it'll be like, well, that's just how Pastor Lara is, and that's just who she is, and that's just how God speaks to her, and it's just a little cuckoo sometimes, let me tell you. But, um, but you know, with me, I'm normal. I like to read the Bible. <laughs> and man, can you imagine God hearing that? And being like, who the crap are you talking about my daughter that way? How could you say that? I'm not saying I'm not saying any of you guys said that about Pastor Laura, okay? Even though that's my mom, that's my mom. You better be careful, okay? Um, but what I am saying is, how arrogant are we, man? And again, this—it's deceitful. God wants to do so much in our life, but we limit Him from doing it because of our comfort and because of our time and our excuses. And we say, Lord, I'll get to it tomorrow when I've got the time. And guess what? You don't get to it tomorrow because your, your condition is sick. He wants to do so much in your life. And if God can take a man who at 30 years old, whereabouts, was, was detesting certain things and saying, Lord, you can give me anything but that. And he's like, oh, son, let me tell you. I'm going to give you all of it. And not only that, I'm going to make you a pastor. And I'm going to call you to start a church. And you guys are going to do a work. And you're going to open up your doors, and I'm going to move in that midst. And I'm going to minister to people. All, all started from a point of him saying, ah, God can do a lot with, uh, he can do a lot. So if you're here today and you've ever thought, uh, on spiritual gifts, my plea to you is this. Just lean in a little bit. Understand this. This is my public profession from this stage, and I'm going to wrap up here. Our intentions are never to embarrass, never to destroy, never to paint a picture that puffs any person who is serving in any type of spiritual gift role or ministering in any type of spiritual gift, it's never to exalt them over you, ever. That it goes against every core doctrine that we believe as a church, it is never okay. Every single one of us, yes, we're human. We prophesy in part, we speak in part, we know in part, but let me tell you something. I want to exercise the, the spiritual gifts that God has given to me and I wanna get so strong in them, not because I wanna be exalted, but because I want to be able to be used by God to do as much as I possibly can. And when you work out, you can lift more. And when you can lift more, you can get more done. And that's the scheme of the enemy, 
is to keep you sidelined and stuck up in skepticism to keep you, to render you fruitless in things that God wants for your life. And you gotta be big enough to say, you know what, Lord, I feel you pushing me in this direction. I wanna know more about it. And if you do wanna know more about it, this is a great place to be. Because I'm telling you, we operate in a level of, of, of integrity here that from other places that we have been, uh, or churches that we have been a part of, it's the level of character here is, um, it, it's, it's very encouraging to me. It's very encouraging to me. Being someone who is on a pastor here. When we leave these things unchecked in our heart, Hebrews 12, 15 tells us this. This will be my last verse. The writer of Hebrews says this, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble and by it many be defiled. There is a tendency when we encounter something that we do not understand to try to make ourselves feel better or even yet to keep us steadfast with where we are at and not moved we will try to bring other people into our accompaniment to make us feel better about not moving. We will associate and we'll try to lure other people in and and, and be like, hey, you know, hey, did you see that thing that took place? Yeah, what'd you think about it? Yeah, it was a little weird, right? Hey, did you, did you, what, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I know, I know. And this is human tendency, but let me tell you, it is a very fine line between deciphering and, and going deeper in the things of the spirit and gossip. There is a very fine line. And when we begin to gossip about things that God wants to do or is doing in our midst that we don't have an understanding for just yet, this verse is so impacting. It says, don't, again, just reading it again, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it, many be defiled. The things that God is doing in your life might only be happening in your heart. And when if he's exposing, if it's springing up in your heart, thank God for community, that we could be in each other's lives to be able to say, hey, let's talk about that. And let's be willing to talk about that. And when we are faithful to do that, I think that God does something really beautiful. And I appreciate you guys sticking with me. Why don't you guys stand up with me? This has been a little bit of a different message for me because I, uh, I, uh, I want, I, I don't, I did not want to, I did not want to bring anything that would, um, I felt a need to explain and to teach from an attitude of not, of making sure that we are all on the same page. And unfortunately, I know how we get, I know our tendency because it's my tendency of wanting to be skeptical. And in and, and, and being skeptical, there are things, there's beauties that can come from it because you're testing something, what it's made of, where it's coming from. Those are good things. Those are not bad things. I'm not saying to not do those things. But when we get to a place to where it starts to drive a wedge, that's when it becomes dangerous. And that's when it starts to inhibit and limit something that God can do or wants to do. If you've ever been skeptical of what, of how much God could move, or if he, if he is still moving and living and active in the realm of spiritual gifts, like what you read about in first Corinthians 12 or 14, I'm going to tell you something. It is still very much alive. It may look very differently than how you think it looks like the YouTube videos that you've seen. And it might be a lot, it's, it's a lot more peaceful than you might experience, have other, experienced otherwise. It's something that cannot be fully communicated, but when you experience it, I'm telling you, it unlocks something. So my plea to you is this, I don't know where all of us have come from in our experiences with church, but this church, we operate in, and we will teach from conviction that God has given you a spiritual gift and many gifts at that. And he's given them to you to help build the church at this point in in, in time. 
You didn't get to choose the year or the time that you were born in, and you were born in this day and age to do something for a good work. And every gift that you have, God wants to employ to strengthen his bride so that he be lifted up, amen? And this is a church that is dedicated to exercising gifts and bringing people up in the Lord in their giftings so that we can go out into the world and preach the gospel to all creation. You can't do that alone. You can't do it without him. And I'm gonna tell you something, when you walk in your spiritual gift, there is a new life that comes over you. There really is. So I want today, if you have, if this message has hit you in any which way and you're thinking, I wanna know what my spiritual gift is, we wanna pray with you down here tonight, or today. We wanna pray with you. I want you to come and have a faith step. Come up here and let's pray together and let's see what God can do with a, with a heart that's wide open, amen? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for today. Thank you for this message. I pray, Lord, that we would not be skeptical in our pursuit of you, Father, but in that, and think that we just have you all figured out. Lord, it's gonna take my entire life to even come close to an inkling of, of, of understanding who you truly are. And even at that, it will not be enough. The more I seek you, the more I wanna know you, and the more, I wanna, the more I know about you, the more I feel like I know less about you because you are so magnificent and you're so awesome. And yet somehow you love me and somehow you think of me and somehow you speak over me and somehow you've given me gifts and somehow you've redeemed me in spite of everything I've done. I cannot fathom it. I do not fully appreciate it, but I want to. And Lord, I pray that what you want to do in my brothers and sisters' lives here who are stuck with me through this message and who are, or who have listened online, I pray that you would do a work in their hearts here today, that deceitful thing that thinks it knows better than you. Lord, I pray right now at the sound of my voice, I pray that if there have been any words that have been spoken here today that have stirred their heart and has made it curious as to what lies in these words that I'm saying. I pray that your Holy Spirit would go where I cannot go. It's not about my work, it's about your work, Lord. And I pray that your work would do something in their heart here today and birth something new that you would give them that gift. Give them the new gift. You tell us in your word to earnestly desire the greater gifts. And as we read here today, Lord, may we not quench the spirit. By definition, that word quench means to extinguish. It was for the title of my message. May we not extinguish, Lord, what you're doing in our midst because of our selfish understanding or because of our lack of understanding at that. May we not extinguish, Lord, but may we be a part of the kindling that makes that fire bigger and bigger and stronger and stronger. Lord, I thank you for this word. I thank you for this house, for the work that you're doing in our community, Lord. May you continue to bring us people that, that need this attribute in their life and that need community and brothers and sisters around them to help them walk in maturity in Christ in their spiritual gifts, Lord. We thank you for this word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This will be the end of our service, but if you want prayer, we wanna pray with you for, for spiritual gifts. We wanna pray with you. We're gonna have some leaders down here available. I'll be down here as well. But I just bless you. Thank you so much for coming today. Just for reverence of the people who will be receiving prayer, if you would take your, uh, uh, your fellowship out to the lobby, then we would just appreciate that just so that people can receive prayer and peace. Thank you for coming today. And... Uh, I hope that today God does something so fresh in your life that it causes you to question something that maybe has been, maybe it's been a big hurdle for you. I pray that today is just a seed for that for you. All right, amen. Come and get prayer if you need it.